Good morning. Christ is risen. Alleluia. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Uh, we thank you for worshiping with us this morning. At this time, we'll invite you to rise and greet one another with the same Easter greeting. Christ is risen. Alleluia. As you are seated, we'll invite you to please fill out the fellowship registers in your pews. Should be on the inside aisles. Please pick them up, sign them, pass them down to those who are seated in the pew with you. With that, uh, we are in the season of Easter, and during the season of Easter, we are following Divine Service Setting 1 in your hymnals. That'll be on page 151 if you want to follow along in the book. Uh, if you're comfortable using the slides, feel free to do that as well. Uh, so with that, we'll begin with hymn 483, the Easter hymn, With High Delight Let Us Unite. God's blessings to each of you as together we worship our Lord. We rise for the invocation. Again, we'll be following Divine Service Setting 1, page 151. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pause for a moment and we reflect on this God's word to us as we examine our lives, especially in light of the Ten Commandments. We see our sin and the need for a Savior. Let us then confess our sins unto God our Father. Most merciful God, 
we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As they called an ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our service this morning continues with the intro. It, the intro it for this morning comes from Psalm 145. We read it responsibly. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all the saints shall bless you. We continue with the singing of the Kyrie, followed by the hymn, This is the Feast. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, Comfort and defend us, gracious Lord.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the reading. Today's first lesson is the account of St. Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. Through this experience, we see the power of the resurrection. For when Paul, a murderer and persecutor of the church, saw Jesus on the road, he repented of his sins, was baptized, and began to share the glory of Jesus' resurrection with others. The first lesson is according to the book of the Acts of the Apostles, the ninth chapter. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the second vision of St. John that's recorded in the book of Revelation, we are given a glimpse of God the Father and God the Son, the Lamb who was slain, ruling from their thrones in heaven. This beautiful picture is the central picture in the entire book of Revelation, where we, along with all of God's creation, worship Jesus both in heaven and on earth for all eternity. The second reading is according to the book of Revelation, 
the fifth chapter. We invite your special attention to the reading of our second reading, as it will be the text for this morning's message. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which is the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went out and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the throne, around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Sorry, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise in the reading of our Holy Gospel. We sing together the Alleluia and verse. This morning's gospel lesson is Jesus' third recorded appearance to his disciples, this time at the Sea of Galilee. The disciples have returned to their old lives, but Jesus reminds them of the calling to be fishers of men. He then assures them that even though he won't always be physically with them, they are still to tell the wonderful news of Christ's death and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins. The Holy Gospel is according to St. Not John, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. And they went out and got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to him, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the full net of fish, for they were not too far from the land, about a hundred yards off. 
When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place and with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have <coughs> breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had, was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, he said, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to them, to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. After saying this, he said to him, follow me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. The congregation may be seated. The kids are invited forward at this time for a children's message. All right, I need all of you to stand up over here. We're going to do something. We're going to pick a king for the day or a queen. Let's be fair, okay? You guys want to be king? Okay, you want to be king? Okay, anybody else want to be king? Queen, right? Okay, nobody else? Why don't you want to be king? Because, that's not a good answer, <laughs> right? Why? Because you can't, why? I don't know. That's interesting that you say that. What are some things, okay, you guys can sit down. Let's talk about this. Okay, what are some things that a good king has to have? What do you think? <laughs> Let's go with one, a place to sit. All right, all right. Well, what makes a good king or queen? What do they have to do? What? They need to what? They need to rule over the kingdom, right? Okay, that's what they do. So if you're going to pick somebody to be a king, do you want somebody who's smart or dumb? Smart, right? Do you want somebody who's strong or weak? Strong, right? Do you want somebody who's good or bad? Dead. Good. Right? These are the things we look for in a king. And you know what, Benjamin, you said something there. You said, well, I can't be a king. Remember? Why can't we be kings? Well, if we're trying to look for the person that's the strongest and the smartest and the kindest and the best, is that any of us? No, that's the hard part. Because we're all, we're all tainted with sin, right? We do bad things sometimes. Sometimes we do selfish things. Sometimes we use our strength, but we use it in bad ways. Or we use our brains and we use them in bad ways. And so all of a sudden, we can't be good kings. And so in our lesson from Revelation, there's a question. Who's worthy to be the king? Who's the one that's worthy to open the scroll? 
it says. And nobody was worthy except for one person. Any ideas who that is? What do you think, Chex? Jesus, right? And why Jesus? Why? What makes him so worthy? See, we talked about... Oh, go ahead. He is the Son of God. That makes him worthy, right? But he did something that made him worthy. What do you think that was? He did take away our sins. And how did he do that? Do you remember? What did he do? He died on the cross. Well, that doesn't make sense. He's supposed to be strong, right? And yet, part of his strength is to die for his people. The picture is given of a lamb who's dead but rose again. The picture is of Jesus who died and rose again. And so he's not dead, he's alive. And that's what makes him worthy to be our king because he can protect us and he can watch over us forever and ever. And that's his promise. And so you know what all of the rest of the text is about? It's about people saying, yippee. Yippee. Although they use another word, they use hallelujah. They're praising God in all sorts of ways. And that's what we get to do. That's what we're doing here today. We're praising God, thanking Him for rising from the dead and assuring us that guess what? No matter what happens to us in our life, no matter how scary it is, He's going to take care of us forever. That's what makes us, or what makes him the king. Let's say a prayer. Let's fold our hands together. Dear Jesus, thank you for being my king, for dying for me, for rising for me, so I can live with you forever and ever. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you for coming up. We continue with our next hymn. I'm going to tell you, um, this one's based on our text from Revelation. And because of that, we don't sing it very often. So it's hymn number 950. It might be helpful if you're not a person that uses the book much uh, to try and use the book, hymn 950, Splendor and Honor.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Christ is risen, alleluia. He is risen indeed, alleluia. My dear friends in Christ Jesus our Savior, I've been thinking a lot this week about one of my favorite movies as a kid. And no matter how old you are, unless you're fairly young, maybe then you haven't seen it, but chances are you still have. It's an old Disney movie called The Sword in the Stone. Anybody remember this movie? Yeah, all right, some of you are familiar with this. This is a movie that was made in 1963. It's a movie that talks about the king of England and during a, a, a time when there was no king. And so in this uh, movie, uh, there is this sword that has been magically put into a stone. you got to love the Disney rendition because it's in an anvil, which is not a stone at all, but it, it makes sense, I guess. Uh, but uh, the idea is this sword is in the stone, and whoever pulls this sword will have the opportunity to, or not will have the opportunity, is worthy of being the new king of England. As the story goes, there is a tournament that's held every year that brings in all the biggest and the strongest knights. And they compete in this tournament, but as part of the tournament, there is this uh, opportunity for each of these knights to come in and, well, tug on the sword and the stone. Try and show whether they're worthy or not of being the new king of England. And so... The best and the biggest and the strongest of the knights, they gather together and they, they, they pull and they use fancy grips and they, I don't know, glue their hands on there uh, so that they can pull and tug. And no matter what they do, even if they put more guys on it, nobody's able to kind of get this sword out of the stone. The main character of this is the young boy. It's King Arthur, by the way, although in the Disney version, he doesn't go by Arthur. He goes by a nickname, Wart, uh, which kind of gives you the idea of what he is. He's a squire. He's a nobody. And he's the squire, the, uh, uh, the, the servant of Sir Kay, who's big and strong and kind of, kind of brutish as part of things. And so his job is to take care of all the equipment and on when you see him with the helmet there, but he leaves the sword behind. So he's sent off to go get the sword before Sir Kay goes into uh, one of his competitions in the tournaments. And he finds the place with their sword locked up. Can't get there. So he sees this sword just sitting in the stone in the middle of uh, this area where it's unguarded. And he goes and he grabs the sword and he presents it to Sir Ector, Sir Kay's father, and hands it to him and says, here, have Sir Kay fight with this. And Sir Ector looks at it and says, it's not the right sword. In fact, this is the sword that was in the stone. Where, where'd you get this? And in the end, well, he realizes that that sword means that this is the new king. And he bows to him, and the rest of the movie is about uh, uh, kind of making up for all of the things, the ways he treated him before. But the question kind of at his heart is the question of who's worthy. Who is worthy to be king? None of those guys, despite all of their strength, all of their intelligence, all of their beauty, were strong enough to get the sword in the stone. That's not what made them worthy. We still have to work on this question. We don't have kings in the United States today, but what we do have is an election every four years. And it kind of is a continuous election because it seems like we finish one election and we start working on the next one. And so there's all sorts of uh, arguments to be made back and forth. There are debates between the individuals. And after everything's said and done, a lot of us end up with this answer. Who's worthy? No one. No one. Who is the person that you trust? 
to always do what is right and not to do what's easy, not to do what's expedient, not to do what's self-serving. And oftentimes it's hard for us to put our trust, our full faith into any one person at all. We've been working through the book of Revelation on different passages over the last couple of weeks. Not just looking at the scary stuff that happens in the book of Revelation, but ultimately focusing on the resurrection end of it. And so uh, the title of this series is Resurrection Revelations. We're in the book of Revelation, but we're looking at how Jesus' resurrection impacts God's people in the midst of it. And part of what we have to remember is the people that John is writing to in the seven churches are people who are being persecuted. Life is hard. They're suffering and dying all around them. And they're starting to ask questions, questions that you might still be asking today. Question like, what in the world's going on? I'm looking at the state of the world and it, I don't like the way it's going. And what's God doing in the middle of it? What's going to happen to us or maybe what's going to happen to our children or to our grandchildren? Or God, are, are you really in control of this? And if you are in control, why aren't you doing something about it? Because my life kind of feels like it's out of control and then it's just going downhill really fast. Ultimately, all these questions can be summed up in this question. God, where are you? Are you taking care of me? Can you take care of me? They're questions that the people John was writing to was asking. They're questions that we still ask today. And so the resurrection revelation today gives us a picture of the throne room of God. And in it we see God the Father and all of his creation gathered together as a word of comfort and peace. Here's how it starts. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals. It's a picture of God the Father holding this, this document, this scroll, and on it is written all the answers to all those questions, those things that we want to know. What's going to happen to me? What's it going to be like in the end? How are you going to take care of me? Are you in control? The problem is it's sealed. Not just sealed with one kingly seal, but seven kingly seals, the perfect number of seals. It is completely <coughs> sealed. And so the question that happens, a mighty angel who is there in the throne room of God asks the question on our behalf, who is worthy? Who's worthy to open that scroll? And the answer is nobody. Nobody's worthy of doing it. Here's how it says it. In no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to get the book open or to see what was in it. And look how John responds. He says, I wept much because no one was found worthy to open or read the scroll or look at it. John is beside himself. He is torn up because there is nobody who can give hope for the future. The mighty angel of Revelation who asked the question, he can't do it. He wouldn't ask the question if he could do it. You and I can't do it. Some of you might recognize this scene. This is a scene from Avengers Endgame. Uh, it's a scene where Thor puts his uh, uh, hammer on the table and they take turns trying to see who can pick it up. It's Disney so they can rip off their own movie because it's essentially the sword and the stone. Who's worthy? And the answer, Thor says, is none of you are worthy, although Captain America comes into play later. 
We aren't one. Here's how Isaiah handles it. Isaiah 64, 6, we are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. There's nothing in us. Even our greatest deeds aren't worthy. They're filthy rags. And so this is why John weeps. Because nobody is worthy. The philosopher John Paul says this, without God there is for mankind no purpose, no goal, no hope, only a wavering future, an eternal dread of every darkness. That's why John Paul, or that's why John weeps. Because there's no hope. We are hopeless, we're empty, we're lonely, we're painful. That's our existence. And yet all of a sudden, there is a voice. One of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. We talked about the lion of Judah last week. Introduced that a little bit. It's an Old Testament prophecy that comes from Genesis that one of, of Judah's sons uh, will rule over the people. The same idea with the root of David or the stump of Jesse. These are messianic prophecies in the Old Testament pointing towards the Messiah who would come, the Christ, the anointed one, the one who would deliver their people. He's the one who can open the scroll. He's the one that can open the seals. This lion of Judah. But here's the trick. The lion doesn't look like a lion. He looks very different. Here's how it says it. So this picture of this victorious king, instead, it says, Then I saw a lamb standing in the middle of the throne, the four living creatures and the elders. He looked like he'd been slaughtered. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. So you have this picture of the victorious king, the lion of Judah, who's not a lion, he's really a lamb who's been slain. So he's victorious because he dies. And yet he's not dead, he's standing victorious for God's people. And yet this is exactly what Revelation's talking about. In fact, it's what John's gospel was talking about throughout our Lenten series when he kept saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the Passover Lamb, the Lamb who was sacrificed, the one who provides forgiveness for our sins through his death in our place. Only this sacrificial lamb looks a little different. Seven eyes and seven horns, which is where Revelation gets a little bit weird. It's symbolic for the Holy Spirit upon the Lamb as He does everything. This Lamb can open the scrolls. The altarpiece of Ghent is a famous painting that catches this uh, picture. And in that, you have the throne room of God and you have all of God's people gathered around. But look how the lamb is portrayed in the center. On the altar, standing up, and if we zoom into the picture, blood is pouring out of him, filling the chalice. The blood of Christ shed for you. This is the victorious lamb of God ruling over his people. It's a picture of Easter, of Jesus' triumph, over sin, death, and the devil. That because Christ is risen from the grave, we have hope that he has conquered completely through his death and resurrection. So what does this lamb do? And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who was on the throne. So the question is, is he worthy? Is this lamb worthy? And the answer is yes, because he can take the scroll. God gives it to him. 
And when the Lamb had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, the twenty-four leaders, or elders, bowed down in front of him. Each held a harp and a gold bowl full of incense, the prayers of God's holy people. You know what they start doing? As he takes the scroll, they begin to worship this Lamb because of what he's done. They sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open the seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people by God from every tribe and language and people and nation. So is he worthy? Yes, he is. And how do we know that he's worthy? Because he was slain. And because his blood ransomed people for God. Not just some people, but people from every tribe, language, and people from all nations. That's the resurrection revelation for us this morning. That there is always hope in God. That in what he has done for us, there is always a reason to hope. So in those times in your life where you are looking around and going, what in the world is going on? What is happening to our world? What's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to our kids? God, are you in control? Why does everything look like it's going downhill? God, where are you in all this? The answer is, he's on his throne. He is victorious. The sinless spotless lamb of God has been slain and has risen and he is reigning on his throne over all creation. And yet in all that, there are still times of suffering for those who are, who are his followers. In fact, that's how God passes the message on to others. You heard that in our first reading. In Acts chapter 9, as we hear the call of St. Paul as he goes to Damascus to persecute and instead sees the risen Lord Christ in all of his glory and is blinded by it. And in the words that, the, uh, that Jesus tells Ananias, he says, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name. And in the next verse he says, For I will show him how much... He must suffer for my sake. This is how it happens. It happens through suffering of God's people. We saw it again in our gospel lesson as you get Jesus and the disciples meeting together again in the third resurrection vision, this time repeating over in a little bit different way what had happened all the way earlier in Matthew chapter 4 where Jesus calls his disciples to be fishers of men. And after that, there is Peter restored into the family, and then there is this place where Peter is told what kind of death he's going to die. That there will be suffering that comes as a part of it. And yet in the midst of it, there's a promise. There's a promise for God's people that... He will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail over it. As scary as it seems, death and hell cannot beat Jesus. So who's worthy? The lamb is. The lamb and only the lamb. And yet, that sends us as his people into song with all of creation. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And everybody joins in. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. This isn't just the picture at the end of time. This is the picture of what we're doing right here, right now in our church. We sang these words just a few moments ago in the song, This is the Feast. If you cut out the words, This is the Feast and all the hallelujahs, here's what you get. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power, riches, wisdom, and strength, honor, and blessing, glory are His. 
sing with all the people of God, join the hymn of all creation. Blessing, honor, glory, and might be to, the, to God and the Lamb forever. Why? For Christ is risen, alleluia. He is risen indeed, alleluia. Amen. At this time in our service, we rise and we speak together our confession of faith, the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. We remain standing for the prayers of the church. In addition to the prayers that are listed in your bulletin, we also have uh, two prayer requests. One, uh, Marge Voigt, uh, one of our shut-in members, uh, fell last night and hit her head. Uh, so she is in the hospital uh, based on that. Uh, also, we continue to keep in our prayers uh, Steve Raymond, uh, who is... Uh, kind of transitioning in hospice and so uh, is preparing to uh, enter the throne room of God uh, in all of his glory. Um, so with that, we keep them in our prayers as well as the others uh, who are listed in the bullet. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. In thanksgiving for the powerful word and spiritual food that our Lord alone provides that we may worthily hear and receive it and fulfill his word for our lives. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for strong hearts and voices to meditate upon the splendor of the resurrection of Christ and to speak of the might of his salvation and his awesome deeds. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the church of God, that many men would be called to the service of the church and to suffer for the gospel, confounding her enemies with Christ's wisdom. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for all fathers and mothers among us, that God would strengthen their faith and increase their joy in the gospel, and that they would declare the mighty acts of God to the generation to come. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for our rulers and the nations of the earth, that God who orders all nations would inspire his church to shepherd them to eternal life. Lord, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for those who struggle amongst us. For Steve Raymond, for Marge Voigt, for Helene Gintz, for Brent Bauman, for Audrey Hofer, and for Mark Greenway. That God would give them faith and grace and be glorified through their trials. Let us pray to the Lord. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. We pray together the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. You may be seated as we receive our tithes and our offerings. As we do so, we'll get to rejoice with the saints in heaven, singing hymn 949, Heavenly Hosts in Ceaseless Worship. Now receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. One of our congregation's favorite hymns when it comes to uh, hymn sings and things like that is always hymn 799, Allah Bare. What people may not realize in the midst of it is it's a picture of the throne room of heaven. And so that's the song that we sing. I will sing praise to my Lord. Allah Bare.
Christ is risen. Alleluia. He is risen again. Again, we thank you each for worshiping with us this morning. Those of you who are worshiping in person, those of you who are worshiping online, glad to have you with us. I invite you to join us again. 8 and 1045 is our worship times for now. We are now in the month of May. And I have to be careful because later on in May, as we get to Memorial Day weekend, things will change and we'll only have one service at 9 o'clock. So just keep that in mind as we move forward. And I'll try and repeat it over and over again. But if I don't, please catch me and make me do it um, because I would forget if I wasn't remembering. All right. That sounded wrong. <laughs> you know what I meant. All right. So uh, with that, um, uh, special thanks to all those who are involved uh, with our uh, rummage sale. So our youth group uh, had a rummage sale this last week. That was some of the uh, traffic that was happening out by the garage. Thank you to those who set up uh, for hours and hours and hours of setup. Those of you who cleaned up, which went much quicker, um, but that's good because we sold a lot of stuff. And so thank you for those who were involved donating or those who were involved working in it. Um, it was a pretty good fundraiser for our kids and I don't have a total, but that's okay. Uh, but um, just know that it was a blessing to our kids and they thank you uh, for all of your help in whatever way it might have been um, as they get ready for the National Youth Gathering in Houston in July. So uh, thank you for all of your hard work uh, for those who are involved in that. Um, other things that are going on. Uh, so uh, we are getting ready for summer. And as part of that, because of COVID and all that stuff, um, some of the things that we used to do haven't been done for a while, like vacation Bible school. Uh, so one of the things, uh, if we would like to resurrect that, uh, bring that back in and have um, uh, Vacation Bible School, uh, we need somebody to lead that. And so uh, please pray about that and see if the Lord is leading you uh, uh, to be a part of that. Um, if we don't have somebody to lead it, when we have lots of people who are willing to help in other areas, it still isn't going to get off the ground. So we need somebody to kind of uh, direct and coordinate that. Um, believe it or not, sometimes that's the easiest of all the tasks uh, to get, but it's the hardest one uh, for people to actually want to do. So um, if you feel the Lord leading you on that, um, it's the director who kind of sets the dates and kind of the vision for it and uh, materials. So um, the person to talk to if you're interested in that is Sue Bauman, our family life coordinator. Uh, so see her about that. We're also uh, in the summer as we move to uh, summer Sunday school, we kind of do a week by week thing. Uh, so you'll see a, uh, a, a sign up sheet go out. If you're willing to sign up for a week here and there um, uh, throughout the summer, um, uh, that gives our regular Sunday school teachers a break. Um, but it also keeps us growing in God's word throughout the year and not taking the summers off. So uh, if, if you can help out um, when that comes around, um, please be a part of that as well um, in all those things. All right. Um, other things to call your attention to. Um, one of those would be Men's Marksmanship Club is coming up on the 15th, 3 p.m. for that. They are getting together uh, with families. Uh, so um, uh, you can, they will be over at Guy and Sue Bauman's house and they will be shooting plinking cans or targets or something like that. Um, even if you don't want to shoot and you just want to hang out, I'm sure they'll allow you to do that as long as you bring something. Uh, so it's a potluck as part of it. Actually, there's probably enough food knowing the people who are signed up already. But uh, there is a sign up sheet just to make sure we don't end up with 14 brownies and no actual food. Although some people wouldn't complain that that's bad. Um, but if you would like to be a part of it, 3 p.m. on May 15th, uh, please sign up uh, to let them know. If you have questions about it, uh, Joe's right over there. Wave your hand, Joe. And Joe will hook you up and tell you all the details. My email's on the sheet. And his email's there, too. If you don't want to talk to him, you can email him. <laughs> all right, uh, that works. Okay. Um, other announcements. Uh, Tasha Jurens announced at the first service, if you see some construction going on here in the next week, 
the his ark child care center has been fundraising for years at this point uh, to get new playground and by new playground i mean um, not wood chips and things that go home with shoes uh, if you know what i mean so they are replacing kind of uh, the underlayment uh, with that fancy springy stuff, uh, rubberized stuff uh, that works better for uh, handicap access and all those kind of things. Um, so if you see construction, uh, that's what's happening. We're not adding a new wing or anything, but it is exciting um, uh, to kind of have us uh, moving in that direction. Um, and so it'll be uh, a, a facelift, if you will, for our playgrounds. So that's what's going on. And so. Uh, just a heads up, that'll be starting this next week on Monday. All right. Any other announcements?